listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. So good to see all of you today and uh, have you enjoy this Spiritual Life Conference together with us. Our speaker for this week and week of Spiritual Life Conference is Dr. Tony Evans. He has served as the senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship for over 35 years, witnessing uh, amazing growth over the years since 1976 that now includes a variety of uh, 100 plus ministries. Dr. Evans also serves as president of the Urban Alternative, a national ministry that seeks to bring about spiritual renewal in America through the church. His daily radio broadcast, The Alternative with Tony Evans, can be heard on more than 500 radio stations throughout the United States and in more than 40 countries. Dr. Evans has written numerous books and booklets, including his legacy work, Oneness Embraced, as well as his vision work, The Kingdom Agenda. Some of his most recent books include Marriage Matters, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, and Victory in Spiritual Warfare. Dr. Evans is married to Lois, his wife and ministry partner of 41 years. They are the parents of four adult children, all of whom serve in Christian ministry, as well as grandparents to 10 grandchildren. And I would like you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Tony Evans as our speaker. It is an honor to be back with you once again and to have this great opportunity to uh, minister at uh, my alma mater and a place that I deeply, deeply, deeply love uh, and to see what God has done in my life and in the lives of those who've come through here and to have be in the place where uh, I have been ministered to spiritually uh, day after day as a student and now um, being able to be here to minister to you is indeed quite the honor and quite the privilege. My oldest granddaughter is named Karis, Karis Grace, and she's um, a third year student now at Baylor University. When she was a little girl, there was this cry from the yard outside of my house. She was screaming, and I rushed out to find out what in the world is going on, and a dog was chasing her. The dog was barking and nipping and making all kinds of noises, and she was terrified. The dog wasn't that big, but as far as she was concerned, it was too big. And she was running in terror. She kept saying, she calls me Poppy, Poppy, Bob, the dog, the dog, the dog, the dog. And she jumped up into my arms, wailing and heaving with fear and uh, uh, frustration and uh, being terrorized by the circumstance she found herself in. She hung on to me as the dog came up near my foot, continuing to make these threatening noises, you know, just, just terrorizing. And uh, she hung on to me, and as she began to get her composure, she looked down at the dog and then looked up at me. She looked down at the dog and then looked up at me. She looked down at the dog again, and then she looked up at me. Then the next time she looked at the dog, she said, Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Everything had changed, but not her circumstance. See, the dog was still there. The dog was still spouting his authority. He was still making his noise. Something had changed in her. And what had changed in her was my presence. The fact that I was now part of the equation gave her a confidence she did not have, a sense of victory she did not possess, and even a willingness to face 
her enemy with authority. I have said to you that I wanted to spend our days on spiritual life coming at it from the perspective of spiritual authority. Because what I am discovering in life and in ministry, far too many Christians love Jesus but have no authority. The circumstances dictate everything rather than than them dictating to the circumstances. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, the apostle, is writing to the church at Ephesus. This is my favorite book because it is Paul's ecclesiological document. And while it can be applied to Christians individually, he is fundamentally speaking to the church corporately and these believers have become discouraged. He tells them in verse 13, don't lose heart. To lose heart, to faint, is to quit, give up, throw in the towel. It is to say, I can't handle this anymore. It is too much, too difficult, too trying. Their own problems and the fact that Paul was their champion, he was going through tribulation, they were losing heart. Paul unleashes what, for me, is his most potent prayer. He has a number of prayers in his works, but this one grabs my attention in a most unique way. He says, for this reason, in verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. At the heart of Paul's prayer is a simple thesis. Spiritual intimacy expands spiritual capacity. And spiritual capacity expands spiritual authority. Or let's say it the other way. If you want more authority, you must possess more capacity. But in order to have more capacity, you must have greater intimacy. Little intimacy, little capacity. Little capacity, little authority. Greater intimacy, greater capacity. Greater capacity, greater authority. He first speaks to their intimacy. And he says, I want to make sure as I bow my knee to the Father and that you understand this applies to every family, every, every name, every, every person who derives his name from heaven, that you will be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. The fundamental job of the Holy Spirit is to make experiential in your life the rule of Christ. The goal of the Holy Spirit is not some ethereal, uh, uh, floating, meaningless concept in outer space. You know that the Holy Spirit is at work because the rule of Christ is no longer theoretical, it is experiential. His job is to make it real. And if it's not real, it's because he's not been allowed to do his job because he's good at it. He says, my goal is that the Spirit of God will so function and work in the inner man to remodel your soul. Because what happens spiritually, internally, will determine your capacity, as you will see. 
I like popcorn. To put a bag of popcorn in the microwave and prepare it to be eaten, especially watching a sporting event, is quite enjoyable. But a lot of people don't know why popcorn pops. You see, every kernel of popcorn has moisture in it. When you put it in the microwave and heat the moisture, the moisture becomes steam. The steam rises. When the steam begins to rise, it presses against the shell. When the shell can't handle the pressure of the heated moisture that has now become rising steam, it gives way. And what you hear in the giving way is pop, 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 pop. You hear an explosion of deliverance. <laughs> As uh, that which is inside expands to the point that the outside can no longer hold it hostage. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to eat unpopped popcorn, but that can be a pretty miserable experience. Who would have ever thought, seeing popcorn pop, that all of that was being held hostage inside? In fact, you can't even find the outside once the inside has expressed itself. One of the reasons why there is so little authority is that people are controlled by their outside, not their inside. Paul makes it clear in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 that there is this three-part reality in our lives. There is the, the spirit, our ability to communicate with God, our souls, the ability to communicate with ourselves, our bodies, which is the ability to communicate with our environment. The way it's supposed to work is that the body obeys the soul and the soul obeys the spirit. So as the spirit informs the soul, the body now knows how to properly function. So the outside does not pro pro function properly because the soul is not informing it properly. And the reason why the soul is not informing it properly it is because the spirit doesn't have freedom to inform it. And therefore our external function is tied to our internal restriction. He says, I pray that your spiritual intimacy, this indwelling work of Christ, in fact, he says that Christ may dwell, the Greek word dwell means to make himself at home, that he's free to visit the library of your mind, he is free to visit the living room of your fellowship, uh, he's free to visit the addict of your hidden thoughts, he is free to maneuver, you know, we. We, we say uh, to people, we have a welcome sign outside of our home, welcome, and we will say to people, make yourself at home. Usually lying, we mean make yourself at room. Because we're going to restrict you to the room we lead you to. But what he says is, I want Christ to have the freedom to maneuver in every aspect of your being, to make himself at home so that the Spirit of God is free to cultivate intimacy. Most of the time when we talk about spiritual life, we talk about intimacy, but we leave it there. The goal of intimacy is not intimacy. The goal of intimacy is authority. And so I had a, uh, I had a problem with my, my uh, sprinkler system. My sprinkler system was not working properly, and uh, I needed it to be fixed. And I said, I'm not getting any power. I'm not getting any power. The sprinkler system is not working. There is no power. The water is not coming on. He checked the box and he said, you don't have a power problem. Something else is wrong. All the power you need is already operative. And then he began digging up my yard, much to my frustration. He began digging up my yard and it was beginning to look a little ugly, and then he comes back and he says, I've discovered your problem. He says, you have a disconnect. He says, one of your wires has come loose. So the power you have is being interfered with by the intimacy you lack. 
Because there's been a breakdown of intimacy, there is no expression of power, even though the power you need to do what needs to be done, you already have. But the disconnect, see the reason why you want the spiritual connect is because you want the authority that goes with it. And so reading your Bible and praying and all of the things we encourage believers to do and they wonder, you know, am I, well, how do I know this thing is hitting? Because it's going to show up in your authority. That's why there are people who are not as theologically accurate, astute, or trained as some would be at Dallas Theological Seminary, yet they seem to have so much power, even with some errant doctrine, then people who understand Greek and Hebrew and all the theological idiosyncrasies of, of, uh, of solid biblical training who have no authority. Because it's not your knowledge that gives you authority, it's your intimacy. Pluto is very cold. Mercury is very hot and it all hinges on their distance. It's cold all the time because it's far all the time. Mercury is hot all the time because it's close all the time. It is your connection to the sun that determines the fire that you feel and the authority that you exercise. He starts off by calling for spiritual intimacy. But that leads him to tell you what the result of spiritual intimacy is, and that is expanded spiritual capacity. In other words, the more intimate you are, the more God you have. Now, I know theologically, you have all the God you're going to get because of our relationship with God. You may have all the God you're going to get, but that doesn't mean you have all the experience from that God that you were meant to have. He goes on and he says, I want you to comprehend, verse 18, with all the saints, so somebody shouldn't have a leg up on you. What is the breadth and the length and the height and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I want you to have as much of God as you can handle because God will only give you as much of him as you can handle. God is not going to waste God on you. A little boy one day tripped and fell into a barrel of molasses. And when he stuck out his tongue and saw where he had fallen, he said, God, please make my capacity equal to this opportunity. <laughs> God will only let you experience as much God as he knows you can handle. God will not waste God. If you take a thimble to the Pacific Ocean and dip it, you will get a thimble worth of Pacific, but you won't get more than a thimble worth. Not because the Pacific can't give you more, it's because you can't handle more, because all you got is a thimble. Well, if you bring a glass to the Pacific Ocean and dip it, you'll get a glass worth of Pacific, but you won't get more than a glass. You'll get more than a thimble, but you won't get more than a glass, not because the Pacific can't give you more, you just can't hold more. If you bring a bucket to the Pacific and dip it, you will get a bucket full of Pacific, but you won't get more than a bucket. You'll get more than a thimble and more than a glass, but once that bucket is full, your capacity is finished and the Pacific is of no use to you. If you bring a barrel to the Pacific and you dip it, it will be full to the top of the barrel, but you won't get more than a barrel because your capacity will only receive what it's designed to hold. You'll get more than a thimble, more than a glass, more than a bucket, but you won't get more than a barrel. If you bring a tanker to the Pacific, the Pacific can handle it. 
It'll fill up your tanker. And you'll get more than a thimble and more than a glass and more than a bucket and more than a barrel, but you won't get more than a tanker because once it's full, it's full. You see, the Pacific is big enough to handle whatever you bring to it. But it's the size of what you bring that will determine how much Pacific you get. The reason why there's such little authority is because there's such limited intimacy. In my fourth year of seminary as a student in the master's program, I was ice cold spiritually. Yet, I was getting ready to graduate with academic honors. I'd made more A's than B's. I loved my classes, I loved my professors, I loved the study. The problem was that they became an end in themselves. They were not utilized after a while to promote in intimacy, I began to focus on grades because I wanted to, to graduate with honors. And as my grades went up, my spiritual life went down. The passion to know him and to be with him and to experience him was not the goal. The goal was graduating with honors. And I became Pluto. Not intending to become Pluto, it's just that that wasn't my goal and as a result, my capacity shrunk. God will give you as much of God that you can handle, but what he will not do is give you more than you can handle because God will not waste God. And that is why, despite education and training, you can have various levels of spiritual authority because the capacity is not the same. God wants to expand your capacity to house him. When you and I get to glory, he's gonna give us a new body a glorified body, the main reason for the glorified body is to give you the ability to handle what you're getting ready to run into. Because you you getting ready to run into a beast. And this body can't handle it. And so you need a frame that can take what you're getting ready to run into in the eternal God unleashed. In fact, it will, it will reflect your rewards in the kingdom. God will only give you a reward in the kingdom based on your capacity in history. The capacity that you develop here due to the intimacy that you possess here will determine the authority you have there. What kind of meta choy were you? And then, having talked about that, he then comes and says the verse that we love to quote, verse 20. It is a favorite verse. It is the verse that is designed to invoke excitement about divine capacity. But read the verse closely. Verse 20 says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This is not a carte blanche statement of superlatives that apply to all believers everywhere all the time. This is a verse that applies to certain believers somewhere, sometimes. Because it's according to What's working in you that determines what's working for you. If there is limit 
power operating inside, there will be limited authority exercised outside. The reason you want to draw near is yes, I want the fellowship, I want to feel the, the nice goosey-goosey spiritual feelings that you get when you're close to Jesus and you know and, and uh, you know the excitement that, that I'm walking with the Lord and all of that is, all that's wonderful and that's nice, but when you're losing heart, when hell is breaking through in your life, when the things you didn't anticipate are controlling your world, Goosey feelings are not enough. You need authority. And now unto him who's able, God has no capacity problem. And his ability is performance ability to do. It's not just talk. Abundantly and beyond the content of your request, what you ask, and the content of your thinking, what you didn't even think to ask. You know you're operating at a whole nother spiritual level when your intimacy has expanded your capacity that God is doing stuff you didn't even ask and doing stuff you never thought to ask. Because now he's free because what you brought to the Pacific was a whopper because intimacy expanded capacity and now there is this superlative operating in your world. My daughter Priscilla, one day I took the family to, uh, to the Grand Canyon for a vacation. We decided to drive to the Grand Canyon and we would have devotions every day or most days as a family and, and uh, we would always take an August vacation. And we drove across country to the Grand Canyon. We got there about midnight at night and I had forgotten to make a hotel reservation. Needless to say, my family was not happy with me. Every hotel, the few hotels that are there, were jam-packed. I stood in a long line of people trying to get rooms and uh, there were no rooms. The next closest hotel was an hour and a half away, at least back then. So I was going to have to, after driving all that time, drive an hour and a half away from our destination just to try to find a hotel room. Nobody's talking to me and my family because <laughs> we've been cramped up in our little car for all those hours and everybody's frustrated. We decided to go to get something to eat before we got in the car to go try to find a hotel. Priscilla looked at me and she said, but dad, you didn't talk to God about our dilemma. To which I'm thinking, shut up. I, I, I don't need you telling me about my talking to God about our dilemma. So I said, you pray. <laughs> and she did. She said, now Lord, you know we are tired. And we've driven all this time and my dad forgot to make a hotel reservation. <laughs> but Lord, you are bigger than this problem. And so God, I ask you, to intervene. This is a very simple prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm thinking after that prayer, okay, that's nice. Now let's get back to the real world. <laughs> I'm tired, we're tired, and we got to hurry up and get on the road. As we were finishing our meal, preparing to leave, the hotel manager came over to me and he said, weren't you one of the family standing in line trying to get a room? I said, well, yeah. He said, I tried to find some of the families that were ahead of you, couldn't find any. We just had one room vacated by an emergency situation. And if you still want the room, it's available. I looked and said, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> yeah. 
see, when the Bible says that Jesus Christ has been elevated over all rule, all authority, all dominion, all power, that's not some theological, theoretical, serendipitistic statement designed to make you feel good religiously. That is designed to let you know he is seated on a throne prepared to overrule stuff. He is seated on a throne prepared to show you he is indeed in charge and all authority does belong to him in heaven and on earth. But only if there's capacity to receive it because there's intimacy based on it. I did a crusade in Columbia, South Carolina at Bryce Football Stadium, the football stadium of the University of Southern California. 25,000 people are gathering for the first night of the crusade. The problem is thunderstorms are predicted and it's an open, of course, stadium. And so we gathered, the ministers and a few lay people gathered to pray before the meeting started. The prayer was led by the pastors who were the organizing committee for the event. And they prayed, Lord, we pray that you'll bless our event. We pray that you'll win people to Christ. And if it's your will, we pray that you will keep the weather good. Nice, nice evangelical prayers. <laughs> and of course, you know, we cert in, in your will to cover our backs, just in case it doesn't work out. There was a little lady, five foot two, named Linda. Never forget it. Linda said, uh, may I pray? And Linda stood up and prayed. Father, you have said in your word for us to win people to Christ. We've gathered together in unity to obey your word. We have used the resources you have provided your people to pay for this venue, to get out the message, to release your word. It would be God inconceivable that you would call us to obey you and we obey you and you control the weather to allow what you control to interfere with our obedience to your command. And therefore, based on your word, I command you to change the weather. Okay, now the preachers are looking at each other right now. That's what she said. I command you to change the weather. We all walk up on the platform. The sky is getting dark. It's seven o'clock. It's time for the meeting to begin. And you hear the thunder. <laughs> We're told the rain showers will be here any minute. They're coming from this direction forward. And what I'm getting ready to tell you is not something that somebody told me. Not something that story I heard about. I was there. My wife was there. It's starting to sprinkle, just a little. The crowd is getting, starting to move a little bit as we're just starting the service. Some umbrellas are starting to go up now. The MC says, brothers and sisters, let's stay as long as we can. Uh, we know it's, it's supposed to rain and, and the thunderstorms are right here, but let's just go as far as we can. Little sprinkle, a gentleman opens up his umbrella, puts it over his head. He's sitting next to Linda, and he puts it also over Linda's head. Linda pushes it back and says, I don't need it. I don't need it. And then to the shock of 25,000 people, the rain comes to the podium and splits. 
Half of the showers go around this side of the stadium. Half of the showers go around that side of the stadium. The rain comes back together again on the other end of the stadium. And the storm continues. If you don't think those folk weren't ready to hear the gospel after that. <laughs> the pastors had position. The pastors had titles. The pastors had, had influence. Linda had authority. She affected the meteorological positioning of nature because she had in her five foot two frame capacity based on emphasis and therefore could declare authority. Contemporary evangelicalism has everything but what we need, authority. You have 1% of the population, the gay population, who is controlling the agenda of the definition of family. That is less than 1% of the population who is controlling the agenda of the definition of family in the nation. How can we have all these churches on all these corners with all these members and all these preachers and all these programs and all these facilities and all this stuff and still have 1% of the population controlling the agenda because we've got programs, we've got facilities. What we don't have is authority, which means we don't have capacity, which means we don't have intimacy. When you have a lot of things that you need plugged into your house, but you only have those two plugs, you get a power strip because the power strip starts with intimacy. It plugs into the plug in the wall, but what it did was expand capacity because now you can plug in more things. And when it expands capacity, you now have power to do so much more. Oh yeah, you want to enhance your spiritual life I want to enhance my spiritual life, but not as an end in itself. Yes, that, that's part of it, to feel closer to the Lord. But why is it that all these folks are going to church and yet our divorce rate is as high as the non-Christian divorce rate? Why is it that with all this evangel, what, what, what is going on here? There is not authority. And that is because there's not capacity, and that is there's not near the intimacy that people think they have because they have religiosity. I mentioned yesterday I'm a platinum flyer with American. And that means that I get certain benefits because I fly a minimum of 50,000, between 50,000 and 100,000 miles a year. So, so I, I'm, I'm a platinum flyer and, and, and I get the benefits of upgrades, if available. I walked up one day and said, um, are there any upgrades available? She says, oh, I'm so sorry. We only had one seat left that we could upgrade, and the person before you um, just came and, uh, and is ahead of you. And we only have one seat. I started to walk away, but then I stopped. I said, the person before me, um, what's their status? She looked down and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. They're gold. You're platinum. Gold is under 50,000 miles. Platinum is over 50,000 miles, which means I have a more intimate relationship. <laughs> so I bumped the gold person ahead of me. And to tell the truth, didn't feel guilty. <laughs> I bumped the person ahead of me. I'm feeling pretty good because you see, my intimacy had expanded my capacity, which allowed me to bump up with my authority. But after I pulled out, another guy came up <laughs> and said, do you have any upgrade seats? Oh yeah, but we have one person uh, ahead of you. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm executive platinum. <laughs> now to be an executive platinum, you have to travel 100,000 miles or more a year. 
So he had greater intimacy, <laughs> which gave him greater capacity, which gave him greater authority, and I got bumped. <laughs> ah, but not to be outdone. I walked over to the telephone and picked up the phone and called a young lady in our church who oversees American Airlines Special Services. <laughs> American Airlines Special Services takes care of VIPs and takes care of uh, special situations for special people. I said, um, I got a problem. There's only one seat left. I've gotten bumped. I didn't mention I bumped somebody else, but I gotten bumped. <laughs> she said, don't worry about it. What airport, what gate? She called the gate and said, we have a VIP person, um, uh, Dr. Tony Evans, and uh, um, uh, do you have any seats? Well, we just have one, but we have an exec. She says, well, uh, uh, he fits in the uh, special services category, and uh, she calls me back over. She said, I don't know who you know, <laughs> but here's your first class seat. See, I had intimacy, which gave me capacity which gave me the authority to overrule. Intimacy determines capacity. Capacity determines authority. Yes, you want to get close to Jesus so you can exercise the authority that you were meant to have for the purposes that God has for you. In closing, on one other vacation trip, I took my family to Niagara Falls. As you know, there is an American side of the falls and a Canadian side of the falls. Our hotel, which I did remember to make this time, was on the Canadian side of the falls. So we went to the Canadian side and got in our hotel room with the idea of looking at the falls the next day. When we got into our hotel room that night, I opened the curtains and I, my breath was taken away as I could see the falls from my hotel room and it was magnificent. I beheld it and I said, wow, they had lights on it and it was way out there, but it was impressive. I just went, wow. The next day we got up, ate breakfast and walked over to the falls, there is a park on the Canadian side of the falls. We walked to the park. The night before, I had seen it from afar and was impressed by what I saw. Oh, but now, to be across the street from it, in daylight, I was affected by the fall. The night before, I was impressed. This day, I was affected because I could hear the roar of the water as it thundered across the precipice and hit the basin. And it threw up droplets that were pushed by the wind, a little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. The night before, I was impressed, unaffected though. Now I was affected because now I was closer. But there's another way you can see the fall. It's called the Maid of the Mist. These are little boats that actually take you to the basin of the fall. They give you an umbrella, they give you a raincoat, because you're getting ready to get drenched. The night before, I was impressed. Earlier that day, I was impacted. But in the maid of the mist, I was overwhelmed. Because I had gotten so close. Spiritual intimacy will determine your spiritual capacity. And your spiritual capacity will determine your spiritual authority. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you in Jesus' name. Amen.